Hey folks, it's Dr. Sohn here. I'm going to walk you through this slideshow that is bonus material for the 747 course. And this is qualitative analysis, data analysis software for beginning qualitative research. Mainly I'm going to be reading the slides, but I'll be adding two or three cents here and there. Um, <clears throat> so might be worth listening to rather than just reading the slides yourself. Here's the agenda. We'll start off with what is qualitative data analysis software. Talk about using digital tools. I've got a metaphor for you as a climber. Uh, I've got a mountain metaphor. Uh, we'll talk about analysis uh, from a foundational perspective. Um, we'll talk about the options that are out there when it comes to the platforms available to you. Um, and then I'll suggest a couple of activities uh, messing about with the activity uh, the, grocery, the grocery list activity after you've chosen from among the QDAS options, and then an article to read to help you consider how and if you'll use QDAS when you do your dissertation. All right, we start off with what it is. It's, it's a digital tool, um, and with tools, I uh, always want to think about what they're capable of and what you can do with these tools is organize and arrange your data. Um, you can upload, depending on the platform, you can upload all kinds of different data, video, audio, text, PDFs, photos, tweets. Um, there's all these different things that, that can be uh, uploaded depending on the platform. What you can then do once the data is there, you can do what Davidson de Gregorio called disaggregate and recontextualize. And what we mean by that is the data within the files can be broken apart into segments, sections, clips, pieces that you can label and search for. And then the recontextualization is those broken apart bits can be rearranged into coherent categories that you create and label based on your research question, your theory. So if you look at the, the image over here, the image is pretty handy when you're talking about data analysis. If you look at the first pile of unsorted Legos, what you've got is like all your interview data, all your observation data, all those things kind of mingled together. Um, when you start sorting those things, that could be considered um, coding. And if you've got codes and memos, um, that might be kind of the arrange step that we see over here. <clears throat> QDOS can help you present your data visually. They can do maps, they can do charts, they can do these kinds of things, they can do word maps. And that last part there, that really, the, the house with the different Legos, that's more like chapter five of your dissertation. Um, and the QDOS cannot write chapter five for you. All right, so QDOS facilitates tagging. If you think about a hashtag on a picture or whatever on social media, people can search for that hashtag and go right to it. A code in QDOS can do the same thing, okay? You, you select your own labels, however. So uh, in this example from Saldana's textbook, we've got a transcript and you could highlight, you know, this he cares about me he has never told me, but he does. So that, you would highlight that, and then you could click, like, create code, and then you could type in sense of self-worth, right? Each of these little pieces has a different code. Um, the textbook chapter is linked right here. You can uh, find in the Canvas module, you can find a link to the slides. And with the slideshow, you can click the links and you can read that. Um, one of the other modules has chapters one and two of Saldana's textbook on coding. Okay, so in the textbook, he asks the question like, hey, would you choose this same code, sense of self-worth for this sentence? You know, what about this part? He's always been there for me even when my parents were not. So here we've got stability. Okay, is that how you would label that? 
Well, these codes will come from, you know, what you think, your, your own experience, but also sometimes your own theories and conceptual frameworks. I think that learning coding can make you a, a better teacher. Um, the process of coding is about kind of finding, uh, you know, the most important aspects of a thing, uh, essentializing, finding the heart of the matter, and being able to communicate it well. So you've got this huge amount of data, you organize it, you condense it, you connect it to theories, um, and then you represent the data in a logical way to answer your research question. So the next section of the presentation, we talk about digital tools. And we all know what has happened with cell phones. Are people using cell phones or are the cell phones using them? You know, um, are you a tool user or are you getting used? Um, these questions uh, for our research matter in terms of knowing what pit pitfalls exist, knowing the trade-offs that exist when we talk about digital versus analog methods. When you get this shiny new technology toy, and, and some of you might choose to purchase a QDOS uh, platform, and so then you've got this money sunk into the thing, and so you might get really wrapped up in it because it's like, hey, I spent this money, I got to use it. Um, but there are traps, and this section we talk about those. Um, kind of an ancient example um, when the written word emerged. Technologically, uh, this this story kind of comes from a Neil Postman book called Technopoly that I highly recommend. Um, we had oral tradition and then it started writing things down. We outsourced, in a sense, memory. So we were able to have books and we were able to store knowledge there. And so it was less necessary um, to have everything stored in the oral tradition in our, in our memory. Um, so... If you don't use post-its or note cards while you're doing your coding, while you're going through your qualitative data analysis, you're not actually writing words. That means that the ingraining in your brain's neurons that happens is going to be different than if you did. Okay, When you're using a qualitative data analysis software, just seeing words and highlighting them on the page, it's it's different in your brain than it would be to write those things out. Here's the thing, though. I know with me that if I were to use note cards, if I were to use post-its, they would get lost. Um, you know, I would have organizational problems. For me, it was never a question when I did my qualitative dissertation of whether or not I was going to use QDOS. I was going to use it because there's no way I'm doing all that. I can't keep track of note cards. So for me, the trade-offs were very obvious in the direction of using QDOS. All right, now we know here's another one. So we, we talk about PowerPoint. We've seen a million PowerPoint presentations. Anyone can make a bad presentation. I would rate this negatively. I got too many words on each slide. Um, if a student <laughs> submitted this to me, I would complain about it a little bit. Um, but we've got this the example here. As you can see, I've got too many words. Well, you can put the words on there, so I just type all the words. Well, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, I don't know if you guys know the history, but PowerPoint was one of the things that was partially blamed for the Challenger explosion. Um, it's too linear. It's too stepwise. It's too sequential. Um, and, you know, when people open up the PowerPoint, it kind of has these guides. It has defaults, and most users fall into the defaults. One of my favorite articles, academic, that I've ever read is this Adams 2006, where she goes into a critique of PowerPoint. And it's a really good article to consider the role of technology in our lives. Um, with qualitative data analysis software, you need to avoid these traps, these pitfalls. The coding trap is one of them. It's, uh, it's coding too much because you can do this so easily, the coding, when you're using qualitative data analysis software, people do it. 
um, whether you're coding manually or digitally, it's iterative work. You code, you memo, you code again, you collapse codes, you re-expand them, you code and memo some more, you change the names of a code, you change the name of, of a whole set of codes. You get immersed in the data this way. This is good. Okay, You can really dwell on the data. And one of the ideas is that the transcripts start to speak to you. You know them so well. Here's a link to the article that describes the coding trap in detail. If you're using a more deductive method for your qualitative data analysis, you could lose track of your research question if you're getting up to your ears and codes. Um, and for what? You can't get perfect codes. There's no such thing. Just because QDOS makes certain process in qualitative data analysis easier, that doesn't mean you should engage in them to an extreme. Another pitfall that that is to be avoided with QDOS is engaging in a mechanical way. I recommend you step away from the computer and think carefully about your data and the patterns that you're finding within it. Um, keep a paper and pencil next to the computer so that you have this material thing that is separate from the computer that allows you to kind of, you could even close your laptop for a while and write and think because that kind of thing could be uh, that kind of thinking might get short circuited when you've got all these buttons and clicks and windows and all that stuff open in front of you. Um, there's another article, uh, a link, um, something that you might want to read if you're going to do qualitative data analysis, kind of learn from people who've been there and done that. All right, I've got a metaphor for you. I love some metaphors. I rarely use climbing metaphors in teaching, even though I'm a teacher. Um, but here it is. So with rock climbing, it's so easy. With mountain climbing, you see the top. You see the top of this mountain that's Alpamaya. The, the point is right there. You know, uh, in 2004, I climbed up about halfway on this face. Um, so it's easy to see the goal in mountain climbing. With qualitative research, it's easy to say. It's easy to say what the goal is. It's just to answer your research question. Um, but to kind of flesh out the metaphor, with many qualitative research traditions, you could say the mountaintop would be the completion of analyzing your data. At that point, you have some themes, and hopefully, they answer your research question. So, hey, you answer your research question. That's awesome. You got to the top. Woo! Yeah, celebrate. The climbers know that. That's only halfway. You get to the top and you have to come back home. Uh, if you if you don't come back home, you can't show your pictures off to anybody. You know, you're obviously there's some problems with not coming back home. So I always say the summit is optional. Getting back to your friends and family is not. But the qual research coming home is a part of the process that connects the answer of your research question to your world, to your district, your region, your state in the educational research community. It's how you make meaning out of the thing in your life instead of just on paper. All right, so it's really easy to get caught up in the qualitative data analysis software, reaching the themes, getting them perfect, doing all that iterative work. But this ain't mountain climbing. There's no summit. You could spend the rest of your life in the coding trap so you've got to keep home in mind and you've got to keep your research question in mind, right? Um, so what qualitative data analysis software can do is help you reach the mountaintop, but you have to step outside of it and do the careful thinking and reasoning to bring it home and put the research to work in your world in the educational field. All right, so if you don't have a strong foundation in analysis, you've got a house of cards. Um, so it doesn't matter what technology you use. Nothing can take the place of careful thinking that has to be done. Computers can do some pretty amazing things. These platforms can help, help you find stuff. They can search the information. They can help you synthesize it, but they can't really, they can't do the thinking for you, even now with all the chat GPT and other stuff. 
So we got to know the fundamentals of analysis. It's often understood as breaking apart complicated things into pieces to better understand it. Here I have this glacier or whatever is breaking into pieces. Um, the whale. The whale is a non sequitur. Um, all right, so the etymology, I love etymology, by the way, uh, with analysis is to loosen up. Um, one philosopher says it's to slacken the threads that hold things together. Okay, we don't want to chop them up into pieces. This is another potential trap of coding, whether it's analog or digital, is you can split mm -hmm. things up in such a way that you forget that they're an integrated whole. So I sometimes talk about, you know, Humpty Dumpty. Don't be all the king's horses and all the king's men. It's just like knocking Humpty off the wall and scattering those pieces. Um, remember that we have a forest and we have the trees. And you have to go back and forth between them in order to do good analysis. So is analysis simply finding patterns? Uh, participants in your study may all seem to be saying somewhat similar things. That could be a theme, okay? But to assure yourself that you aren't just seeing what you want to and avoiding details that might reveal contradictions, you have to engage in systematic analysis. You need a process that has protocols, and that's why we've got all this information and instruction for you on the coding process. A little more here on kinds of analysis. Inductive analysis is when you look for patterns in the data and identify them. This may be when you start with open or in vivo codes and slowly reduce them to axial and then selective codes. There's potential to miss the forest for the trees here, but this is generally what we want to do in qualitative research. You notice the image of the pyramid. We have all these open codes. We have the raw data. That's the hugest pile, right? And we work it down. We reduce it by coding, having the open codes, and then axial, and then finally selective. And these ideally, these selective codes are encompassing statements and themes within the data that answer our research questions. Sometimes in qualitative work, we do deductive analysis, um, and it's sometimes called content analysis. You might start with particular codes in mind, and maybe those come from your conceptual framework and you search for examples that fit them. The risk here is cherry picking. That you, you might miss out on some very important details and trees and therefore misidentify the forest. Uh, but depending on the qualitative tradition you select, this might be acceptable. Um, Delve is one of the qualitative data analysis software platforms and they've got some really good videos on their website. And this one talks about what I just covered in two slides in more detail. You can check that out if you go to the slideshow. Uh-oh. I don't know what to... Okay, so there's one more kind of thing, and that's abduction. Okay, abduction is the process of a creative leap that goes beyond the data. This may happen to you as a kind of eureka moment in which a theme jumps out at you from the data, or actually you're walking your dog or whatever, or walking down the hall and you get the moment. And it's like, that's what some people call the abductive leap. And that's your intuition working. And I say in qualitative work, we have to have both our logical side and our intuitive side working together. And so when you get one of these moments, do not ignore it, but definitely work with your coding protocols Check with your peer debriefer to make sure that the intuition did spring from data that is defensible. When we talk to you about this as your dissertation chair, we're not playing a gotcha game. We're very concerned that your readers take your work seriously. And so when you have one of these leaps, these abductive leaps, these intuitions and eureka moments, we want to help you and we want the peer debriefer to help you make sure that you've got your receipts, okay? There's a great article that I recommend, uh, Knopasek, 2008. It's about making your thinking visible. We sometimes talk about an audit trail. And 
the thing that was so handy for me in my dissertation was to be able to track my thinking with all the memos that I had made because they can track them by date. You know, like here's how I was thinking about this at this point in time. Here's how I was thinking about this point in time. Um, again, with making thinking visible, you can't only do it on the digital platform. You have your research notebook that's analog as well. Okay. But this is the thing that will help you present your results with kind of that right mix of balance where you show all your steps, which again, when you do that, that builds your credibility for the reader. All right, so here are the options. Um, you can think about wants and needs. You kind of like see like that shiny new toy and you're like, I really want it. But it's like, hey, what do you need to actually accomplish the work that you need to do? Okay. And so there's a lot of options out there. And again, when you click on the link from the Canvas module to the slides on their own, you can explore all this stuff on your own. Okay. That's the kind of person you are great. But I've already done a lot of exploring for you. I've got some experience. And these are the three that I recommend. QDA Minor Lite looks a lot like Max QDA. Um, they're very similar with the way that they look. What I've got linked here are tutorial videos for each of these. Okay, QDA Minor Light is free. That might make it quite attractive to some of you. Um, I did buy Max QDA at the time. It was the only major uh, QDOS that you could purchase outright. Now, all of them, if you're gonna pay for them, are subscription, okay? That's Max QDA. Uh, Delve is a one is a platform that uh, one of our students highly recommended, and um, I've looked at it, and it looks really clean. It, it it might be the easiest to deal with visually because it doesn't hit you with so much. Now, of course, there's trade offs, right? That's there's a trade off there, but I suggest you check out all of these. And if you are kind of overwhelmed by QDA Minor Light, I'd probably go with the free one. But if you really like the, the WordPress kind of look of Dell, then go with Dell, you know? Um, so this is a thing where you're gonna to have to explore these for yourself and make the decision. Okay, the most popular QDOS platforms are in Vivo and Atlas TI, and I don't recommend those. And, and one of the reasons is, because over the years, they have gotten more and more and more and more complicated. Atlas TI was kind of the original, most popular one. Uh, it's one that you'll see mentioned in, in a lot of research articles. They, they focus on it because it was kind of the original, most popular. In Vivo came along, and uh, I think now in Vivo is the most widely used. Both of these things have features that we just don't just don't need them and, and because we don't need them they really make things complicated uh, and there's only one caveat my main recommendation I, I told you I've got those three that I recommended on the previous slide but what supersedes that recommendation is that if you have a friend or a neighbor or a colleague who can sit down next to you I don't mean you're doing a Zoom with them. I mean, they can sit down next to you and walk you through how to use a particular QDOS platform. That would be the one to go with because that's the one where you're going to have somebody who you can actually say, hey, how do I do this? How do I do that? And that's going to be really handy. Um, otherwise, you're relying on tutorials um, and you're kind of learning through the process of experimentation, which is great. And you can start that right now. That's how we learn. It's the best way to learn. You're not going to break it. So just click, code, mess around. So I suggest you take the grocery list from lesson six in the module, put it into the QDOS that you've selected, um, and start coding. Watch the tutorial videos, mess around. Watch some more tutorial videos, mess around. Try the different queries. You can nest codes. That's kind of the different layers of coding, uh, open axial and selective. There are other features you'll see mentioned in the tutorials. Um, so do it. So, you know, you mess about. It's, it's how you learn. This is this is my daughter's um, sign. So she's messing about. She's learning how to write, you know. And so, you know, with 
with help from older brother we can usually interpret what she's written but this is how we learn stuff so you mess around you have fun this is a restaurant yassines if you're in knoxville you know yassines the special is hamburger today all right so make some signs do some coding mess around with the q dots all right finally um I've recommended throughout this presentation, but here I'm quite explicit about finding the, the balance between analog and digital. Um, and remember that the tool needs to serve your purpose. Okay, I've got an article that I wrote uh, in 2017 after my dissertation. I did some more research into qualitative data analysis software. You can click on the link to get to it from the slides that are available in the module. Um, if you're leaning towards phenomenology or that's one of the things you're thinking about doing, read it carefully. Read it very closely. Otherwise, you kind of skim parts of it that focus on phenomenology and just focus on the data analysis sections of it. When you're done, these are some questions to ask yourself, to think about. And hopefully, doing this will prepare you well to use QDOS for your dissertation. And your dissertation chair will always be available at any time. Reach out, contact us, and we will help you. All right, thanks for watching.